How is everyone this evening? Happy. <laughs> um, it's really an honor to be with you here this evening. My name is Jim Doty, for those who might not know. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. Um, and tonight it's really an honor to um, introduce to you Robin Youngson. It's interesting because he's, I guess we called New Zealand Down Under. Uh, but I was also down under just last week in Australia, in Sydney and Brisbane. So I just came back from down under, and I guess we sort of simultaneously came back. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I got a cold there. But um, what really, uh, actually, tonight's talk uh, resonates with me because, as I think many of you know, I'm a neurosurgeon on the faculty here at the School of Medicine. And one of the interests uh, that has always been with me throughout my entire medical career is uh, this issue of actually connecting uh, with patients and being sensitive uh, to uh, their needs. You know, unfortunately, what has happened in our medical uh, system uh, in the United States, and I think in other parts of the world, is that physicians are so uh, lost in their own world of their own issues, and I think Robin's going to address that, that sometimes they forget that the interaction that we have with a patient, oftentimes while it's a routine for us, uh, for many of these patients, it's the most single important event for them and their families in their entire life. And to uh, not acknowledge that and uh, uh, indicate your concern in that regard really is an insult to our profession and frankly, it does not lead to the best medical care either for the patient or caring for the family, which is also uh, uh, very important. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Robin uh, actually has had a circuitous path to where he's at today. Uh, he uh, initially uh, graduated from Cambridge with honors and uh, was trained as an engineer initially, and then uh, worked hard and uh, saved his money and ended up uh, going to medical school in Bristol, where he also graduated with honors and ultimately trained as, in I guess down under we call it an anesthetist, uh, here we call it an anesthesiologist. But uh, throughout his entire career, even in early in his training, he's been very interested in patients and uh, as his own career developed, uh, interested in uh, doctors themselves and how uh, they respond to the stresses of their profession. Uh, as part of uh, his continuing development and uh, being involved in uh, more and more leadership positions, both in, uh, uh, is it West Auckland? Mm -hmm. uh, what, I couldn't pronounce White Techery. Yeah, I, I, I took a long time to figure out. White Techery, which is a Maori, Maori word. Maori word, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, which means, what, city next to village or village next to big city or something like this. Right? Um, <clears throat> but he's been very involved uh, with healthcare in the region. Um, in fact, being involved in the uh, development and design of a new hospital, which is very uh, patient-centric, and uh, also uh, with the development of programs to uh, make physicians understand uh, their actual uh, place in the system and the need for compassionate care and care to themselves. And this has developed into not only uh, local involvement but national and international involvement and his most um, heartfelt uh, I think uh, uh, motivation at this point is to really reconnect medicine with its core value of compassion many of you saw his book here time to care uh, which is a wonderful book that uh, talks about these issues in a very inspiring way he has his own personal story Many of you have probably seen the movie, remember The Doctor? Remember that movie where the ENT surgeon, I, if I recall correctly, got cancer, and then suddenly he became a patient? And uh, when you go from, now, neurosurgeons are typically humble and self-effacing, so it would apply to me, but uh, when, you go, <laughs> when you go from a, an arrogant, uh, brusque, rude uh, surgeon, uh, which they do exist, believe it or not, uh, to being a patient, it is puts you in a very different role, especially if you get treated like you've treated people, and suddenly you get great insight. Uh, 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 and I can tell you from personal experience, when I was in my training, 
uh, I was out with some orthopedic friends of me who, of mine who I won't give you all the details because I would be very ashamed and uh, I have to apologize. But to make a long story short, we ran into a tree at 40 miles an hour and I was the only one wearing a seat belt. It was a lap belt and I had my own experience where I had a, a fractured spleen and a, a transected small bowel and a back fracture and catechinus syndrome, a neurogenic bladder uh, and bowel. And it was, uh, my chairman though was so compassionate, he said if I wasn't back to work in 30 days, I would have to repeat the year. So uh, I was back in 30 days, but it wasn't the most uh, compassionate of situations. And uh, uh, so, so without further ado, I will introduce uh, my friend Robin Youngson, who will talk about compassion in healthcare and his book, Time to Care. Thank you. Jim, Jim, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's certainly a great honor to be a guest of Seacare and to give this invited lecture. I thought coming from down under from Aotearoa, which is the land of the long white cloud, I might bring an ancient greeting from the Maori people of that as a way to start the evening, and I'll translate it for you. Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hokio ho te hei mori ore. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tātā koto, e nā mihi mahana ki a koto. E tika ana e mihi ki te whare e tūne, ki te papa a tā koto nei, tēnā koro a tēnā koro. E nā mate, haere, 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 ki e tātā nā maraho rātou mā, tēnā rā tātā koto. E rau rangatira mā, kua hui mai nei e tēne wā, ka nui te araha, Motokoto manua nui ki te tōk tōko tō kōpapa tō rānei nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So that means listen to the call of the mussin bird, listen to the call of the kaka present. Hear my voice also. Tihe is the first sneeze of life, and Māori ora is the life force that flows through everything. And then welcome, welcome, thrice welcome, very warm greetings to you. It's appropriate to acknowledge the sacred building that stands here and the sacred ground that it lies upon, to acknowledge the spirits of all the departed, many of you I'm sure work in healthcare. Um, we've seen many patients pass. And to bring us back together to all of us who are the survivors. And then to acknowledge all of the esteemed leaders, Roaring at Terima, the esteemed leaders who gathered today, and to thank you for your heartfelt commitment for supporting the purpose of this evening. Therefore, greetings, greetings, greetings. I think sometimes in the Western world we've rather lost the art of making greetings in that way. So there's a little bit of New Zealand for you. The, um, the talk this evening is advertised as a book reading and, and I'm certainly not going to do that this evening. I hope you're all going to do that. Uh, but the lecture is very much based on many of the stories um, from the last 15 years that are in the book and a lot of the scientific research that I've uncovered that really has surprised even me, so I'd like to share that with you. I think um, healthcare really is in a, in a beleaguered state. It's really hurting, so I want to begin thinking about what it's like to be in healthcare and then how we find hope and the role of compassion and caring in that. So yeah, this is just the book I'm going to draw upon. And there's plenty of copies here, and I'm happy to give you a signed copy at the end. It's uh, $20 for you. This is Coldplay.
So that's the question in such a beleaguered healthcare system under so much stress. With so many healthcare professionals burning out, the figures in the United States suggest that about one in three doctors in any one time are approaching burnout. How do we find hope? How do we rehumanize the system? How do we create a system that meets the needs not only of our patients and our families, but of the health professionals that are suffering so much within it? Um, what so often we do is focus too much on the problems and trying to f solve those instead of looking for inspiration about what does work in a process of appreciative inquiry. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that even in the most disordered system, even in the most stressed hospital um, that's completely overwhelmed, there are some inspiring health professionals that come to work every day with a smile on their face. And they have this big bubble of unhurried calm around them. And they always find time to listen to their patients and to show compassionate caring. And you know, they just seem to be immune to the irritations that upset all the rest of us so much. And they go home at the end of the day with a smile still on their face and a deep sense of satisfaction, having found very significant meaning in their work and, and joy in their practice. And, and in every hospital I've ever worked in, no matter how stressed and difficult and overwhelmed, you always see these wonderful individuals. So um, what is the secret of these happy health professionals and how can we learn from them? And, and that really is what my book is about. The secret to this transformation is reconnecting to the heart of your practice. And there's a set of daily habits that you can very deliberately choose that you bring to work. And these are the very small acts of kindness. Just moving the water jug so it's within reach of the post-op patient. Um, holding a door open for someone. When you see someone lost on a corridor, instead of just rushing past them so full of your own busyness and self-importance, stopping and saying, can I help? And when they're asking for a department, walking them there and talking to them instead of just giving directions. And the, these health professionals that very deliberately adopt these daily habits of kindness, of appreciation, of gratitude, thoughts in their mind that their work is a, is a, is a tremendous privilege um, choosing to love their work, choosing to love their patients, bringing mindfulness, being fully present, so that when they're sitting with a patient, no matter how many other patients they might have been thinking of, in that moment they're fully present for one patient. Uh, bringing compassion not only to their patients, but to themselves, because in a career in healthcare, you're going to make mistakes, things are going to go wrong, you're going to hurt people, and if you can be compassionate and kind to yourself, you're going to be much more kind and compassionate uh, to your patients and are refining the joy of service. And this, uh, for me, has transformed my work and my career and being an engineer first and then training as a doctor and then becoming an anesthesiologist and working in a big teaching hospital. You know, I was kind of the king of technical medicine. And although I had a degree of, of empathy with my patients, I did not have the skills of human connection, of empathy, of compassion, um, many times I would feel really inadequate. If I harmed a patient through error, I would run away and never see that a patient again because I would have such a profound sense of professional failure and was so embarrassed and I did not have the confidence and the skills to go to that patient and to say sorry and to show that I cared. And through learning many things about medicine, and, and I often say that most of the important things I learned about being a doctor I learned outside of medicine. Um, in various leadership roles. Um, and bringing these to my daily practice has really been transformative for me and has given me a great deal more resilience and well-being and happiness and meaning and joy in my life. And now we have a great deal of evidence in support of that assertion. Researchers like Barbara Fredrickson, this is a really great book. She's a renowned researcher, but she's also a great writer, and this is a book I'd commend to you. And the REACH search is showing that the pathway to flourishing for every human being are small acts of kindness and gratitude and appreciation and serving others, um, not just for health professionals, but for all of us. So there's a powerful amount of evidence now in the last 10, 12 years out of the whole field of positive psychology, um, reinforcing what we've learned from anecdotes and stories um, over a lifetime about what is it 
that those people that come to work with a smile every day and derive such joy and satisfaction, even in a really difficult environment, how is it that they rise above the institutional limitations and rules and still provide compassionate care? Um, and this is the science of, of positivity lying behind this. What's even more important are these exceptional individuals that bring the smile and compassion and, and mindfulness and stillness and provide care to a whole patient. There's now a powerful amount of evidence that this whole person compassionate care is safer. It's more effective. You have a much more satisfied patient who's got a therapeutic relationship with a doctor or nurse or a therapist. It achieves better outcomes. It actually saves time. When I poll health professionals around the whole world and ask them, what is the greatest barrier to compassionate care? And they say, you know, get real, Robin, we just don't have time to care. And, and that's why I've taught my, called my book Time to Care. And it's not just making time to care, but now is a time. This is a call to action. It's time to care again. And the evidence shows... Um, from science and from practice that when you become skilled in making a connection and show kindness and compassion to your patients, kind of time expands. And even in a busy day, you find that time to make that connection. When you make that connection to patients, you find that the demands that they make upon you reduce very dramatically. And the more energy we put into trying to limit demand and defend ourselves, the less satisfied are our patients and the more they will keep coming back to us with every concern and complaint they have in their lives and we'll make ourselves responsible for that. And when we connect our patients in a more deep way and provide personal service, when I bring the service of my knowledge and expertise and power and authority in the service of the patient's concerns, that's a profoundly different relationship than trying to fix someone or just help someone. And in those circumstances, the demand on you reduces um, quite dramatically. It gives back so much meaning to work. Instead of physicians and nurses burning out and feeling they have to take time out, it's a way to reconnect to the meaning and joy and purpose of your work so that you find meaning in work and you find joy in work and you find resilience in work. Um, and it costs a great deal less because it's care that's so much more effective. And you're much, much less likely to be sued. Um, I come from a country where it's against the law to sue a doctor, so it's not something I worry about a lot, but I don't get patient complaints either. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the neuroscience of compassion, and there'll be people in this audience who know a great deal about this. Uh, Paul Gilbert is a renowned uh, academic in the UK who's probably the world leader on compassionate mind therapy, particularly for uh, patients with mental health disorders. And this is his model of six components of compassion. And it's all those elements of empathy and sympathy, that sensitivity to notice that something is, needs attending to, non-judgment. It's a motivation. Paul Gilbert says that compassion is not an emotion. It actually is a motivation. The definition of compassion I use is the humane quality of understanding suffering and desiring to do something about it, so it's a motivation. But he points out, and this is the bit of the pie I've pulled out a bit, that you are not able to be with a patient and show compassion unless you are able to tolerate distress. Because when you bring up in heart a compassion, that empathy means that the suffering of your patient you feel within yourself and you suffer with the patient. And unless you feel able to stay with that suffering, if, uh, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel inadequate, if you feel incompetent, this problem is too hard, there was nothing in my training that told me how to deal with this, um, I've made a mistake, I have nothing more to offer, the patient has cancer, it's irresectful, I'm really sorry, I have nothing more to offer. If you feel so inadequate, if you don't have those internal resources, you will not be able to tolerate that feeling of distress within yourself and the shutters come down and the clinical detachment steps in and you walk away and you're not capable or if you're burnt out. So the question is, you know, how do we develop these internal resources that allow us to be resilient, um, to have a big heart, to tolerate that distress and to be with a patient in the most awful circumstances and still bring an open heart and show your compassion? And I want to explain a little bit about that because we've learned a lot about the science of it. So every human being has two competing systems of motivation, and in any situation, 
Um, we may have an approach motivation where we're feeling confident and having positive emotions. Or we might be feeling pain or anxiety or fear and distress and we may want to protect ourselves and withdraw. And in any situation, we have these two competing systems of motivation in our brains acting and, and whether we approach and stay with a patient or the shutters come down and we kind of withdraw with clinical detection. It depends on the balance between these two. And a good way to explain it is that um, for most of my life, I've been rather socially insecure, and if I go to a party full of people I don't know, I tended to hang back in a corner and be quite shy and um, not engage very well. In contrast, my four-year-old granddaughter, Sophie, has uh, the most amazing social confidence. She could come into this room with these adults um, and uh, be at the front, and within five minutes, she'd have you waving, doing high fives, laughing, telling stories, whatever. I mean, she just has an incredibly powerful confidence and approach and motivation, so that's the kind of difference. And, and this is important to understand in a, in a tense and difficult clinical situation of which of those competing systems of motivation is going to win out. So it's what I call the compassion tipping point where the patient is suffering in front of us, our empathy leads us to suffer with them, and do we have the, inadequate, the adequate resources to approach um, and to show compassion and keep our hearts open or are we going to withdraw in detachment? And it turns out that the, the most important way to build those internal resources of positivity and well-being are those simple daily practices, very deliberate practices of small acts of kindness, of gratitude, of appreciation. And when you drive to work in the morning, you have a choice about the thoughts you have in your head. And you can fill your head with all the thought, grumpy thoughts about resentment, about how overworked you are and how demanding the patients are and how your colleagues always let you down and how awful the traffic is and arrive at work you know, filled with those thoughts. Or you can, in a much more mindful way, think about the extraordinary privilege of the intimate human connections that you're going to have with people going through life crisis or the birth of a child or death and the extraordinary privilege of that and when you reflect on those things those are the things that build up your positive and well-being with appreciation and gratitude. Now it turns out that this kind of gets hardwired into our brain what we know now is that the most of the positive emotions are organized on the left prefrontal area, the emotions of joy and happiness and love and compassion, and a lot of the negative emotions on the right prefrontal area of anxiety and anger and um, distress. And now we can put patients or we can put subjects in a functional MRI scanner and we can look at the relative amount of blood supply and, and uh, metabolic activity in these two centers and we can tell, is this a grumpy, short-tempered, unhappy anesthesiologist? <laughs> Or is this a you know a happy, relaxed, um, loving anesthetist with a lot of equanimity and, and peaceful and calmness? And you can actually tell this from the right of the amount of activity. So when we go to the gym and exercise, muscles get what guess what the muscles get bigger and respond pretty quickly, and and our brain responds exactly the same way through neuroplasticity. So when we very deliberately choose to focus on small acts of kindness and gratitude and appreciation we are actually changing the structure of our brain and we're growing more blood supply, more neuro, neuronal connections, uh, new neurons, and we're growing and expanding the positive part of our brain and we're shrinking down the negative part of our brain. And as that happens over months and years, we develop much more equanimity, we're much less likely to be frustrated and angry, we respond much more calmly to situations. Um, and this is the neurological basis behind the internal resources that allow us to be there and to show open-hearted compassion. Now, when, when I went to med school at about the same time as Jim, I guess, um, we were taught that clinical detachment was you know, something really to be um, strived for, for two reasons. One is that we were advised that in our career we're going to see many tragedies, like the slides I showed the photographs in the beginning, trying to resuscitate and losing a baby. And that if we um, were emotionally connected to our patients, that we would not be able to withstand that, that we would be so suffer the tragedy that we would burn out. And this was a necessary and important psychological defense mechanism. You've got to keep your emotional distance from patients. The second reason was that it was argued that you cannot be objective, you cannot make good clinical decisions unless you're uh, detached um, emotionally from your patient. Well, I'm very glad to say in my personal experience, and now the science is showing that both those assertions are wrong. And it's possible to be 
to have fully open-hearted, compassionate, deep connection to your patients and to witness tragedy and not to be, um, not for that not to lead to burnout. In fact, the more open-hearted compassion you bring to those situations, the more you protect yourself from burnout. And that this idea that you can be detached from another human being is completely wrong because now we know that there's a whole new science called interpersonal neurobiology. So when we're in close relationships to other people, uh, the structure of our brain and the structure of the other person, they actually start changing. We start influencing each other's physiology. And it's like we have a broadband internet connection between our nervous systems and we have a, there's a specialized system of neurons called mirror neurons, which are very large neurons, very rapidly acting. They can recognize facial expression within about 1 20th of a second, and it's easy to demonstrate in our lab. You can flash up subliminal images of a photograph of a face showing an emotion, and the most people in this audience will be able to tell you what emotion is being displayed, even though they weren't consciously aware of seeing the face. So it's very fast reacting. So this idea that we can somehow be detached from patients is completely wrong. And even if we somehow kind of put on this cold air of clinical detachment, our patients don't have that. And that kind of feeling and physiological reaction in ourselves is transmitted powerfully to patients and it strikes coldness and fear into the hearts of our patients. So even if we pretend to ourselves we're disconnected, um, our patients feel it most profoundly. And there's very, a huge way of evidence now that, that our thoughts, our feelings, our intentions, and our physiology that we bring to every patient I encounter profoundly affects the patient's physiology in an important way, you know, within minutes. There's one particular physical way that occurs. Um, I'm going to come on to that. Um, in the research for my book, um, I, I had an idea that, um, that, that human touch might somehow be healing. What was very surprising to me is that um, there are a very large number of well-conducted, well-designed, randomized controlled trials showing that a variety of forms of healing, of touch therapy, even therapeutic touch, which does not involve touch, physical touch of the person, it's holding hands and a, a healing intention, changes in an important clinical way a very wide variety of clinical outcomes. It reduces pain, it reduces stress response, cortisol, um, premature neonates in scabu that clearly are not consciously aware of an adult standing there and putting their hands there. Their physiology changes, the number changes on their monitor, the balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic activity changes, their breathing becomes more regular, their complications are significantly clinically reduced, and their length of stay in special scare baby unit is reduced. And these are, this is proven in randomized controlled trials. There's even trials, you know, medical students, they don't eat a great diet, and half of them are anemic. So this is a randomized control trial of anemic medical students that are divided into two groups, and one group had therapeutic touch and the other didn't, and a month later they measured the hemoglobin levels, and on average it was higher in the group that had the therapy. Um, there are studies looking at tissue cultures of cells and showing changes in cellular differentiation. So there are, we don't know exactly what the nature of the force field is that transmits information and intention and healing, but it, there's a great weight of scientific evidence published in reputable journals. So you know, what this means for me in my practice is that I am extremely careful about the spirit that I bring to every encounter and I pause outside the door of the patient's room and I think, am I bringing grumpiness and busyness and the thoughts of the other 20 patients and resentment into this room or am I going to be centered in myself, fully present and bring kindness and gentleness and compassion and I do that very carefully and mindfully uh, before each patient encounter. Um, because that profoundly changes the physiology. And I've had patients who have had extreme needle phobias. That's kind of a problem from an anesthesiologist, right? <laughs> you can't give an anesthetic without sticking a needle in. You get someone in who's, you know, since the age of four has had a severe needle phobia and isn't going to let you come close. And just through the quality of presence and trust and influencing the patient's physiology in those ways. I've had patients who've lain there on the bed without their heart rate going above 60 who've allowed me to approach them and put a needle in without pain or distress or fear. And that is the, the, the size, the quantity of effect that can be influenced. Now there's another kind of cute thing. I'm going to demonstrate this with Jim. <laughs> so, so if I come and do this, 
there's something really interesting happening. <laughs> and that is and that is that if we put a if we put EEG electrodes on Jim's scalp and an ECG EKG electrode on me, we'd find that some of Jim's neurons are firing in firing in synchrony with my heartbeat and some of my neurons are firing in synchrony with his heartbeat. So we have a big electromagnetic field and we measure the EKG on the skin, but it extends a long way. So the nature of your heartbeat and the variations in the heartbeat are actually influencing the patient's you know, neural physiology when you approach close to them, uh, even before you're touching them. So there are many, many ways in which a health professional's thoughts and feelings and intentions kind of radiate and, um, away from them and profoundly influence the physiology of a patient. And you know, even doing a job like anesthesiology, I found that to be really important. Now, is this just nice, touchy-feely stuff? You know, it was kind of cute that Jim got goosebumps. <laughs> but, you know, does it, does it really matter? You know, it's, you know, it's great for our patients to have a good emotional experience. They say, that was a wonderful doctor, and he really listened to me, and he trusted, you know, I trust him more, and I go and follow his instructions. So there's a weight of evidence that the, the bond of trust might be important, but, you know, does it really make a difference to our outcomes? Um, yeah, it does. And it makes a difference to how it comes. It's of a size, probably that may be more powerful than a lot of the medicines and surgeries that we do. So um, there's now a weight of evidence from the last 10 or 15 years about um, how profoundly your emotional and psychological well-being influence uh, physical health outcomes to the extent that it's probably better to be a really happy, optimistic smoker than a miserable, pessimistic, anxious non-smoker. You're probably going to live longer <laughs> because the difference in mortality rate between optimists and pessimists is at least as big as, for cardiovascular disease, is at least as big as the difference between smokers and non-smokers, and it may be bigger. And there are some, you know, some really striking studies a uh, very large study in the Netherlands, 999 Dutch seniors who had all survived a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and they were followed up for 10 or 15 years for as long as they survived. And a month or two after their heart attack in rehab, they did a, one of these sophisticated psychological questionnaires that measures, is this a happy, optimistic, uh, carefree person, or is this a you know, deeply pessimistic, anxious person? And that these are very... Uh, easy to measure, and they divided into four groups, and two groups in the middle, and the optimists here and the pessimists here. And the pessimists over the next 10 to 15 years had four times the mortality rate for cardiac causes compared with the optimists. And for all causes of mortality, they had three times the mortality rate. Um, there are many other examples. If you take a class of medical students that would fill this room, and you gave them the same kind of psychological profiling and divide them into three groups, and then, I'm sure they must be paid, and only medical students would agree to have this done to them, but you inoculate them with a standardized dose of influenza A, and it turns out the pessimists will have three times the rate of clinical infection compared to the optimists. So there's an overwhelming weight of evidence that if you're anxious and depressed and um, pessimistic, that your immune system will be profoundly um, suppressed. And those who are optimistic and, and and happy are much less likely to get infection. And the ratio is probably about three to one. Um, it shows up in wound healing. If you, There was a study looking at medical students who were about to have an exam, and they did a punch biopsy on their gum and made a whole four millimeter hole in the skin under the gum and measured the healing time. And those who were about to have an exam examination, it took 40 or 50% longer for the wound to heal. So, you know, I've often been asked, you know, all very nice touchy-feely, Robin, but, you know, I'm going to have my hip joint replacement done. You know, I'd rather have a surgeon who's just technically competent. And I was saying, well, you can, there are surgeons who are technically competent and who are kind and compassionate as well, which would be great. But, you know, they probably have a significantly less rate of, you know, wound complications and infections and, and so on. So, so these are very important effects. Um, we, it really is our duty to attend to the emotional and psychological and spiritual experience of our patients because these are powerful uh, therapeutic tools we have in our hands and it makes a profound difference to the experience of, of our patients. There's a small but growing amount of evidence that compassionate caring saves time. What's happened in our systems is that they've got so stressed and busy that we've fallen into kind of chaotic reactive mode. And the best example of this is the introduction of early nursing rounds, 
on a busy ward, medical ward, where there's not enough nurses and too many patients and they're flat out all day, the nurse in charge says to their staff, in addition to all the work you do now, I'm going to ask you every hour to go back and see your patients and saying, are you comfortable, Mrs. Smith? Is there anything I can get to you? Do you need to get to the toilet? Do you need some pain relief? Do you have everything reached? This is the plan of care. I'm going to book on an hour and check with you. And the nurses say, you what? <laughs> you know, that's crazy. We don't have time. When you do it for a month, they would never go back because the evidence shows that the amount of time that they, the number of call bells reduces 50 or 60 percent. The demands on the staff dramatically falls. Um, the patient's satisfaction rates jump up 20 or 30 points on the scale. Um, you get fewer complications, fewer patient falls. If you put a pedometer on the, the leg of the nurse, she will walk one mile less on a shift because instead of totally reactive care that's just responding to the call butters, you have proactive care that's based on the concerns and needs of the patients, and that profoundly makes the care more efficient and increases 20 to 30% the amount of face time nurses have with patients in direct patient care. In my own practice, I find that, is, that if you take the trouble right up front to take some care with some introductions, to meet someone as a human being, to find out a little bit about them, to explain who you are and what the purpose of the meeting is, to explain what you're going to be doing and ask the patient's permission for that, and to say, before I start that, it would be really helpful for me to know, is there something on your mind going round and round, a question or a concern? And you just hit pay dirt time and time again, and you really get to the heart of the matter and um, patients' perception of the amount of time you spent to them expands. You spend 15, hours, 15 minutes with the patient and they think that they've had a whole hour because you really listen to them. And you avoid that awful heart sink moment where you've spent 45 minutes with the patient they're just going out the door and do you have any other questions? They say, yeah, doctor, I was really worried about this. And you suddenly, with a heart sink moment, thought, realize you've completely missed what's really important. So in my own practice, I just see as many patients in a clinic as my colleagues do. Um, the patients kind of walk out the door feeling standing a bit tall, you know, taller and more confident and much more satisfied. I'm having a great deal more fun in my day. Um, my practice has been joyful. I, I chose a career in anesthesiology so I did not have to do clinics. And now the world has changed and anesthesiologists have to do clinics. And now it's a source of considerable joy and satisfaction for me just meeting all those different people. I'm, I'm going to give you one example of a randomized controlled trial of evidence in compassionate caring achieves better outcomes and costs less. This is from the United States. It's Aetna, one of your large insurance groups, did something really smart in patients with unresectable lung cancer that normally what would happen if you wanted palliative care, you'd have to sign this form and then they would no longer fund the chemotherapy and the surgery and so on. And Aetna said, we're going to fund palliative care in addition to all the other aggressive medical care that you want. We'll fund it all. Uh, but if you agree to be part of this trial, then we're going to randomize you into two groups and one group will have access to palliative care in addition and the other will not. And we'll see what happens. And it's a large trial of nearly 300 patients. The outcomes were really interesting. Those who had, in addition, access to palliative care, only 16% of those patients had symptoms of depression. And the ones who did not have access to palliative care, 43% had symptoms of clinical depression, a very big difference. The costs of care were strikingly different. And the patients who had access to palliative care, which is an add-on, an extra cost, their average day per hospital admission was between one and a half thousand and four and a half thousand US dollars less per stay because they're making very different choices when you have a palliative care nurse or physician who talks to you about your life goals and what you really want to achieve in the last six or nine months of your life and what's really important for you. You make very different choices about the chemotherapy or the surgery or whatever and that reduces the cost of care. So that's a pretty good trade-off. I think if I had an unresectable cancer in a limited time, I would be willing to trade off survival time for quality of life and achieving some life goals. What's interesting is what the survival time was. And those who did not have access to palliative care, but they had access to all of the chemotherapy and the surgery and ICU and aggressive medical therapies, mean survival time 8.9 months. Those who had, in addition, palliative care, mean survival time 12 months. So this is more humane, compassionate care that costs less, has better quality of life, better outcomes and increases survival time. So there's a growing weight of evidence about that now. 
So how do we make this change across the whole world? Um, this is a difficult subject to talk about. In the hospital medical culture, it's really an undiscussable issue for a physician to talk about their own vulnerability, their feelings, loving your patients. I mean, it causes a lot of embarrassment. I've been doing it for a number of years now, and I kind of got used to it. Um, I've sat on executive management teams and national committees and worked with the World Health Organization. I've been trying to progress this agenda for many years and made very little progress. Compassion and caring and kindness and loving does not fit well in a committee structure. <laughs> Authority figures in general are not that they have a lot of other pressures on them, so there has to be a better way. So we've launched a global social movement called Hearts in Healthcare. And we're inviting any kind of health professional or students or patient advocates or health leaders or any other kind of supporters to join within us and to create a social movement in healthcare and to join together all of the like-minded people in the world who thinks this is really important. Our aims are really simple. To allow compassionate caring to rise above institutional rules and limitations, to encourage health workers to reconnect to the heart of their practice and to increase their happiness and well-being. And we've just a month ago launched a website. It's a bit like Facebook. It's a social media site. Jim signed up this afternoon. Thank you. Would have felt guilty. <laughs> and these, these are just uh, some screenshots. And then what I'm going to do, so it's you know, kind of like Facebook. What I'd like to do is often I've brought a lot of my own personal stories, but now that we have a growing movement that's stretching across the world, I'd like to show you a short film that brings some other voices and talks about compassionate caring and what it means in the workplace, and, and that'll be the end of my presentation. So we'll just um, find the movie for you. I've started to believe that some of the heart and humanity had gone out in nursing practice, but it was becoming a technical task, not a human endeavour. Staff say we don't have time to care a lot, and I think part of it is we are busy, people are in shorter periods of time, and people are sicker because we're turning the men out much more quickly and not always appropriately. If you're running too fast and don't look like you're approachable, then you're not going to get, you're going to miss the key messages from that family. When I went to my GP, she just looked at the books and said, you need to go to hospital. And I'm not taking that away from my GP because she's great, but at my GP, she was strictly business, I guess. I mean, I'm not saying she doesn't care because she does. Why is crazy? I'm running as fast as I can just to be on the same spot. Something's not right. I don't think they're yearning um, so much to, to have the nurse that has all these qualifications and works, um, you know, understands evidence-based medicine. What they really want is to engage with someone who um, is emotionally available. And to me, the heart of nursing is someone holding your hand when you're desperate, when you're scared, when you're dying, not necessarily the person who manages to fix the machine up properly to deliver the right dose of medication. And I don't underestimate the importance of getting that right, but it's in parallel to the human relationship that the nurse has with that person who's in a state of fear, anxiety, pain, and, and needs that human re reassurance. So what, what struck me was um, how helpless I was in certain areas. I had all these skills, but at the same time, they didn't marry with um, what people really wanted. And it was this sense of hopelessness, <laughs> or in, in, in adequacy, really, after being qualified and trained and all that, that, that made me look at the body. 78% of those doctors said that the practice of medicine was no longer rewarding or was less rewarding than it used to be. 60% of them said, they would not recommend nursing as a career to their children. I was the biggest cynic of the, um, <clears throat> of the healthcare system, I think it was. And I was very angry, you know, because here I was <clears throat> with my heart wide open to, to serve and, you know, um, to give in that capacity. And then you get on the ward and you're so caught up in um, just the tasks and being so busy that it's extremely frustrating that you can't you know, given the capacity that you want to, and you see so much suffering around you. The research shows that nurses come into their profession with very high ideals of 
whole person of compassionate caring. And within two years, such are the pressures of the system, the focus on tasks, the busyness, the competing demands, the kind of unwritten rules of an institution that says just put your head down and get the job done and don't make a connection to your patients. These are the things that are really leading to high rates of burnout and depression, and many nurses are job popping or leaving the profession altogether. It was when I was working on a very, very busy, busy medical ward um, as a registered nurse, and uh, <laughs> it, it's interesting that when you go into handover, often um, the nurse is handing over to you from the night shift will kind of set the scene for the day, and uh, they didn't tell me about this uh, young troubled soul. They told me about this uh, this um, AIDS case who'd gone psychotic and um, you know had had. Uh, called security up in the night to help, you know, sedate him and get things under control. Well, normally when you go to a hospital or when you're visiting a consultant or a doctor, they just strictly worry about what the problem is. They're not actually worried about you as a person. And we have nurses who want to do that, but feel disempowered, I think, at the moment. And it's about how do we get them to re-engage with the values that they brought and the aspirations they brought to nursing. Why are health professionals feeling so discouraged? Why are there such high rates of burnout? I think the reason behind this is that healthcare has become dehumanised. There was a time when we could only examine the outside of a patient and we had to treat the whole person. And now with advances in medical technology, we're focusing on ever smaller and smaller parts of the human body. And instead of treating a human being, we're just treating a medical condition. So for condition X, we need to give treatment for So we're sort of seeing a, a clinical attitude with them and just thinking that the clinical attitude could be turned around to a compassionate attitude would make all the difference to the healing. And we kind of treat the body and forget the spirit. And that's, for me, that's like sewing a garment with a needle with no thread attached. Well, when we focus only on treating disease and not the person is that the treatment becomes impersonal. The person we knew, Susan Jones, becomes the breast actress on Ward 6. You know, sharing your body, I guess, and, and the things that are wrong with you with other people, it's a big thing. It's, to it's the privilege that you have as a nurse to be allowed in to do some of that very intimate work with somebody. And it's not threatening and they're okay and they're happy to let you do that. Isn't that actually a privilege to be allowed? And isn't that so important in expressing the work of a nurse that you're able to, to do that? We actually had a bit of a hard day that I had a newborn who was in the booth for about five weeks. And then um, I was in town in the hospital and I seemed to hide myself having my kidney removed. And then I got better and then we find out my son ends up in here. So it was shocking. It was shocking. We just thought he had a beating nose or he just had a slow heart, but when we found out what it was, it was the reality of getting his heart cut open and all that just blew me away. It just really blew me away. Um, so we have a young boy here, um, he's eight years old, and he was diagnosed with rheumatic fever in November of last year. Um, and as part of his treatment, he's been essentially bed rested for the last five months. So he's remained in hospital, away from family and friends. Seeing my son lying on the bed in ICU with all these tubes and everything hanging out just broke me down. Yeah, really broke me down. So I think you've got a very short time as a healthcare professional to build that trust, to um, to hear what they're saying, and for them to give you the permission that it's okay. I, I really do want you or need you in part of caring for my child. What we've certainly seen with him over his stay is that his mood has you know, has decreased. It's certainly reflecting. You know, the longer he's with us, you know, the more his mood is despondent. So we've had to think of ways of um, and I'm proving that to, to make sure that you know, not only are we treating him medically, but we're treating him as a, you know, the whole person, the whole little boy. He is an awesome doctor. He tries to help Amata in ways that maybe the other doctors couldn't. Or... Yes. But actually some key things to him getting better is actually him being happy and a bit of fun. Very part of that is they take him and they go to the cafeteria here and he gets to choose something, his drink or something to eat. And be part of a team. I think it's a good thing.
Yeah. Um, when Tessa Porter, the doctor, greeted me, she um, came straight up to me and Edie was really busy. She put her hand out to shake my hand and then pulled me in for a kihi. Uh, that's the normal way we greet and I instantly felt like um, family. I don't know, like we made a connection and then she made me feel comfortable the whole way through the consultation. So Nessa said, be part of our lives for so long now that they're part of our family. And we'll never forget them, Nessa. And we'll always love them for that. Always. We're going to tear some more right now. How do you get nurses to say, in that precious moment, you know, yeah, and it may only need to be a very short moment, but it is just stop and connect. Ask them how are you, how is it going? And when health professionals connect to treating a person as a whole person rather than just treating disease, then they find so much more joy and satisfaction. What a difference it makes, actually, from a practical level, you know, being a nurse on a busy ward, that when we take that moment to just connect with them from the very start of the shift and, and let them know that we're here and we're present for them, there's a lot less um, symptoms and calling out and buzzer pressing <laughs> um, I've actually noticed. One act of tiny kindness, mm -hmm. it can make it you know, can make, make the day or you can save a life mm -hmm. of something. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and kindness as well is something that I find that is contagious. Because, I mean, that's why I came into medicine. You know, I wanted to be helpful and supportive. And we don't want to be making people be compassionate, because you can't. How can you make someone be compassionate? We want it to come out from inside every one of them by just putting the ideas there. And for them to start recognising that it's actually more fun to behave in this way than it is to behave the old way. You bring your heart to the patient's bedside. And you give some, you spend some time that really gives you deep satisfaction. I mean. And he needed very intense one-on-one -on -one nursing, so I, I put my hand up for the job, as I don't think anyone else was really willing. And um, there was a particular moment where things had got a bit heated up and out of control, and he was, um, you know, pulled his cannula out and was flinging it around the room, and so the blood going everywhere, and uh, he was, yeah, quite. Quite distraught. I just kind of knelt down in front of him and I just looked him in the eyes and I just said, you know, namaste, which means I honour your divinity. I looked him in the eyes, you know, I could see the distress of his of his being and um, how it was being reflected through his, his physical um, healing crisis. It was like he just stopped, you know, the chaos in the moment. But that had caused, uh, you know, a real ease in his soul. Um, and in mine. It was, it was really obvious to me, and what was more important, it was really obvious to him. But in fact, that was the underlying reason of why he kept coming in with these heart attacks. And I will never forget the moment that he reached out and he grabbed my hand and he said, thank you. Thank you. And I know that I, I just helped him reach the, the underlying reason. I just helped facilitate the process of what was actually underlying his disease and his disease. And to me, that, that, that was my very first shift as a doctor. How do we begin to change the whole world of healthcare? I think we've had upon a better strategy. And that's to create a global international social movement within healthcare that connects together all of those in the world who are passionate about rehumanizing healthcare and strengthening care and compassion. I think uh, it, it, it brings me to a more, a more personal level of, of why I became a doctor in the first place. So we start off with those individuals who've reconnected to the heart of the practice and found their, their new flourishing on well-being and happiness and joy in their work again. And we start to connect them together in networks. And they can be in any part of the world they come online to our online community. They start to share stories, ideas. My environment is a reflection of myself. So much easier to work on just me rather than trying to change the whole hospital. And just start where you are. You know, we don't have to do a, you know, three months or three months or something. You know, you can start right now. You know, by connecting, by being present. And mindfulness. And then in, in certain places, just wherever the ground is fertile. You start to get a community of practice. And it will become part of the culture of, of the organisation because people will never forget that what we're here for is to provide an interaction between human beings 
as we care for people with sync. So in different places in the world you have communities of practice and then they start to link together. And when they link together something really something really interesting happens. These new practices start to become the norm. There is no other way. I was born with this whole connection of mind, body, spirit that's so important and we can't neglect this in healthcare. Ever, I believe. Now we have a name for that, hearts in healthcare. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. This is just um, many of the people we're beginning to connect with. We've taken filmmakers with us, and um, these are some of the leaders in the hospital in Rotorua, New Zealand, that have a pilot program going in, in the pediatrics. Um, I'm touring the USA for a whole month, and that's entirely by invitation to all the places in the world where the grand is fertile, where the leaders saying this is really important work to do. Come and connect with us. Come and help us. Um, We've no idea where else in the world it's going to spring up. I'm very delighted to be here in Stanford this evening. This is the very first stop on the way. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you, Robin. That was very inspiring. Can I just <clears throat> ask you a question? Are any of you medical students in here? One. Doctors? <laughs> We're not interested in those. <laughs> We're all patients, you yeah, know. <laughs> the reason I ask is, uh, you know, these these issues are universal issues, and it's been really, at least for me in my own practice, uh, <clears throat> sometimes demoralizing to see how patients are treated or how uh, physicians uh, view themselves. And, and, you know, we talk about compassion, recognizing another suffering. Oftentimes, these doctors are suffering, right? And, and they don't even have their own insight to the pain they have. And a manifestation of that oftentimes is that they pull away from the patient. You know, it's interesting. I, <clears throat> I give a talk called uh, Compassion and Caring uh, periodically. And <clears throat> in that, I tell stories uh, about experiences I've had with patients who taught me lessons in my own life. Um, and it's not unusual for me to get tearful sometimes about that. And it's fascinating because at the multiple times I've given this, when that happens, it is extraordinary because invariably there'll be a nurse or somebody like that there. They'll stand up and go, you know, in my entire career, I've never seen a doctor cry or show any emotion. Now, isn't that extraordinary? That somebody would say that they have never seen a doctor show feelings or, or a connection to a patient on a deep emotional level. You know, it, it's fascinating. I <clears throat> was recently honored with, do any of you know what the white coat ceremony is? Mm -hmm. The white coat ceremony, for those who you don't know, is this is a, um, uh, an event that occurs at medical schools right before the students start medical school. And what happens is that uh, they're given a white coat, they take an oath, typically the oath of Hippocrates, uh, but it can be the oath of Memories or one that they uh, create themselves. And it's they're really their initiation into the, the, the profession. And as part of that, they typically ask uh, a person to speak who hopefully is an inspiration. And I was that person this last year. But you know, in, in this lecture I gave to these students, what I said to them was, because there is a misperception that somehow science and technology are gonna solve all of our problems. And they are not. And what I told these students, and I truly believe this, and I think uh, Robin will concur, is, you know, they certainly have their place, but science and technology is not going to soothe the child who's in pain. Um, the science and technology is not going to hold the hand of someone who's in pain or dying. And those acts, those acts of true kindness to patients, that is the art of medicine. And I will assure you at least in my 23 years of practice as a neurosurgeon, it is that which is as or more effective than all the science and technology in the world. 
<clears throat> the other thing I'd like to just to mention as we close here is the endpoint, <clears throat> or the, the, the final comments I made to these medical students. Um, is that vodka? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. One of the final comments I made to these medical students, which I think echoes what Robin was saying, and what I, I said was, you know, we have a mnemonic, or we use mnemonics when we're in medical school to remember either certain arteries, veins, nerves, et cetera. And what I told these students was, and this mirrors what Robin was saying is, I use this mnemonic to put myself in the right position every day to be a good doctor, but it also puts you in the right position to be a good person. And that mnemonic is this part of the alphabet, which is C D F G C D E F G H I J K L. And I go through this every morning. <clears throat> and if you do this, at least for me, and I think perhaps for some of you, you might find this useful. It starts with compassion, understanding that everyone is suffering and that you're suffering and have an insight into this. The other is D is for dignity, recognition, or recognizing that every person has the right to have their dignity respected or to be given dignity. E is equanimity, understanding that there are ups and downs in the world, whatever profession you're in, but the fact of the matter is the ups always become downs, downs will invariably become ups, and it's taking life as an understanding that you don't get lost in either of those extremes. The other is forgiveness. Robin was talking about, you know, making mistakes, and it's horrible when you do that and you injure somebody. And the fact is, all of us are going to uh, hurt other people. Maybe not as a physician, but you're going to. And the other side of it is that the people are going to disappoint and hurt you. And unless you can forgive people, you are locked emotionally, and you cannot go beyond that. So being able to forgive, and that's not to uh, let them off the hook, it's not to let them go, but it's to sincerely understand that what happened happened, and as long as you grasp onto it, it's going to lock you in a place you don't want to be. What some people say is not forgiving is like every day feeding yourself poison and somehow thinking it's going to have an effect on the other person. Um, the other is gratitude. You know, it's so often that so many of us Instead of looking down and saying, God, look at, I am so fortunate, I am so blessed, I have so much, what happens to many of us, especially in the U.S. and our modern society, we're looking up saying, I don't have this, I don't have that, my house isn't big enough, I don't get paid enough. And the fact of the matter is, if we're in the United States, if we're sitting in this room, we're better off than 99.9% .9 of the people are. Um, Age, humility, that's what I always forget because I'm a neurosurgeon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, as, as I practice as a physician, and I think Robin will acknowledge this, you know who are good doctors, and the way you know who are good doctors is when they walk to the hospital, they have respect for every person on the healthcare team, whether that person is changing the bedpans, whether that person is changing the sheets, whether that person is sweeping the floors, or is the nurse. Each of us has a critical part on that team, and when you show respect for every person on that team and say, thank you, it puts you in a completely different mindset, and the people respond to that. When you walk in, you know, it's interesting, I was hired another neurosurgeon at a different institution, and the people knew I, I was going to be leaving. And when I walked to the hospital, probably 20 people gave me a hug, you know, kitchen staff. Uh, people, uh, again, changing the bedpans, some of the janitorial staff, nurses. And <clears throat> this neurosurgeon's with me. And at the end of this, he goes, what is wrong with these goddamn people? <laughs> can, can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, he was so absolutely clueless that having a personal connection, you can get so much more done. When people are passionate and respect you and desire to work with you, they work far beyond what you could ever pay them. Humility. Integrity. You know, doctors, it's so hard sometimes. You know, you hear about these things where, and it's true of business people too, 
and doctors especially, where, you know, if we don't value our integrity, it is easy to have the slippery slope where you do one thing and you think, oh, well, it's okay for now, and then you will go completely slide down out of control. And I've seen it happen over and over again. J is for two aspects. One is justice in the context, at least as a physician, we have a responsibility. We are the last wall. Uh, often trying to our patients. Social justice, making sure they are protected. The other aspect, though, which is very hard for many of us, is not to be judgmental. It's, you know, you see some patients who've done acts, you know, heroin addicts, prostitutes, and, and who are out of control. And they're really suffering, but it's so easy to get into the thing to somehow imply that they, it's their problem. There's, you don't like them. They're not human. They're not like you. And in fact, they're all like us. And it is not far in the right circumstances. Phil Zimbardo is sitting right here, who many of you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he can attest to the fact that the difference between going and involving acts which you would be ashamed of and are despicable and being a, uh, a, a, a person who is well-respected in the community, if the circumstances are right, that can switch in the horrible direction. So recognize that you are potentially capable of doing that, and whenever you look at these per people, that could be you. The, last, or the second to the last one is kindness, and kindness is fundamentally the action of compassion. And at the end is love, which we try to send out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and the question was? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jeff. That's, that's a wonderful summary. I hope we've got that on film. We'll uh, yeah. transmit it around the world. So, so it's a, a critically important person. I don't know if you could all hear it. Is what can you do as a healthcare administrator to support these kind of qualities uh, within the, you know your workplace? How can you support your staff to uh, have that resilience and, and compassion? Um, my view is, after many years of trying to change the world, is that in the end, there's only one person you can change, and that's yourself. And and the most powerful thing that you can do personally is to role model all of the alphabet letters that Jim just talked about. And, the, and, and I've seen so many healthcare administrators that will put in place a management restructuring that causes a lot of people to lose their jobs and be deeply fearful and so on. That is the completely opposite of you know, non-judgment and compassion and integrity and love and, and kindness. And, and if in a, in a health leadership role, in all of your business relationships and all of your and managerial relationships and the way that you treat staff that are in difficulty and if you bring deep love and compassion and kindness and understanding and judgment, judgment to that, you will change your entire institution. But it's, and, and to encourage all of your staff that, that, I mean the evidence is there that compassionate caring is far more effective, it's going to be costly, you're going to have fewer compliance, you're going to get better outcomes. If you're looking at, I've worked in hospitals where 30% of the nurses left in one year do you know how many millions of dollars that costs you? So there's powerful evidence now that if you, you know, what I'm, I'm completely convinced after 30 years that the most powerful motivation for any kind of health professional is this deep desire to care for people, whether you're a neurosurgeon, an anesthesiologist, a nurse, a therapist, or whatever. I've met very few health administrators who think that that is, who understand that that's the core motivation and who think that these doctors are just greedy and they want more money. And when leaders stand up and talk about this is the way you make a contribution in our hospital, 
and yes, you have a professional or technical role that's in your job description, but we want you to show compassion and loving kindness. We want you to have humility, the ability to learn from others. We want you to, um, to show you know, compassion and understanding and support from, from all your health workers. And if you role model that in your own relationships, in your management hierarchy, then you will change the culture of a whole place. And the role models are the most powerful influence. And it's just be very mindful. What behaviours do we reward and what behaviours do we sanction? And my test is in a, bu in a busy ER, if a nurse, a kindly nurse, was to keep still and keep quiet and sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and hold the hand of a frightened elderly lady, is that behaviour going to be sanctioned or rewarded? That's the level of the, how behaviours get reinforced and in almost every hospital I've worked at that behaviour would be sanctioned and they would be told off and said go and do your tasks, your blood pressures and so on. So you have to have a system that rewards kindly behaviour and paying attention and balances that with the need to do tasks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You know the second thing is though, these actions that we're talking about here, these are so cost effective. I mean it's an extraordinary simply doing some of these things human touch, getting the time to talk, you know, if a person is engaged and you, as you point out, if you, you dramatically decrease the turnover among nursing staff when they feel they're supported in their desire to care for patients, you save millions of dollars right there. And, and it's, it's extraordinary that this isn't more aggressively integrated. I had one um, dean of a medical school we're talking about instituting a program of kind of compassion training for medical students. So what do you know about compassion? Their curriculum is already too full. Yeah. Can you imagine? Your yeah. curriculum is yeah. already too full. Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman at the back has been very keen. Yeah, I have a lot of experience with this. In the last couple of years, I was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer about a year and a half ago. Um, I suffered through uh, psychology one and something else. Yeah, yeah, 
Uh, thank you very much for your comments. I know in this country, and certainly in Australasia, there's a very powerful movement called integrative medicine, which is taking the best of conventional scientific biomedicine and combining it with the best of evidence-based complementary and alternative therapies. And the very passionate lady at the end of that film who said, you know, we had, there is no other way, we just have to bring this, that's uh, Dr. Lily Thomas. She's the newly elected president of the Australasian Integrated Medicine Association. They're making great strides, and there's a very similar association here. So I think there is a big dearth of knowledge. Um, it occurs to me, in, in response to your question earlier, uh, so often I've been in a smaller hospital where there are some senior doctors who are, you know, the, to use an implied expression, they're assholes. I mean, they, they get away with a whole pile of, you know, very bad bullying behavior. And the evidence of I mean, the impact of that on patient care is, you know, um, Joint Commission call that a sentinel event, the disruptive physician behavior, bullying behavior, does so much harm to patient safety and care that, and, and they say, well, you know, we just can't recruit doctors and we put up with doctors that, that misbehave and are bully and abusive and treat their patients and staff badly. What I know from experience is that the, the huge majority of those doctors have never ever had feedback, ever, not in their entire career. And I had the job of giving personal feedback and coaching to doctors who behave badly, senior doctors, which is kind of interesting. And, and most of them did, just had no idea at all. And one episode of feedback and it was, you know, got better and some were more difficult to deal with. For every badly behaved doctor that you sack, they might be technically competent, but if you say this behavior is unacceptable and if you persist on it, you will lose your job, and then they leave their job, 10 more will queue up at the door saying, holy shit, I want to work at that hospital because they really mean it. You know, they really want to have caring doctors. So it's, it's really important to deal with the very disruptive people. Um, even if they're the most, even if they're neurosurgeons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the back there. So. Yes, yes. Um, I was really struck by um, your question you asked, is there something like a Um I'm an adult hematologist oncologist, and we work very much with our trainees on communications. And so I wondered if you could comment on what you find in terms of physician self-disclosure, and it may occur with other staff. So, so this is. Can I can I clarify that? So, this is, these are physicians that are attempting to be empathetic, but somehow miss the mark. They're just disclosing about themselves. Okay. So, so what we call um, autobiographical, you know, empathy. You know, when the patient says, you know, you know, why are you crying? Well, my dog just died. Oh, yes, I had a dog and he died and it was awful. And you know, kind of. Um, that there are there are a lot of skills to be taught in expressing empathy um, very effectively in a non-judgmental way. Um, I think it's, it's a much more interesting and broader question is, you know, should physicians actually reveal elements of their own life experience? You know, do they need to be the completely detached kind of clinical person or they can, can they be in, in the hearts and healthcare community where there's a, there's a vivid um, discussion going on about this at the moment and the consensus view is, yeah, we're all just human beings and we're trying to do our best and you can share your own life experience and that can be deeply comforting to a patient in terms of being able to demonstrate that you have you know, some better understanding, but it mustn't fall into the autobiographical <laughs> empathy. <laughs> um, it always has to be about you know, portraying empathy for the patient, not the doctor trying to... Is that, is that the comment here? Yeah, that's yeah. a great term. That really describes it well. Yeah. Because it, it falls into the time factor, because when we discuss these issues with our trainees, yeah. the bottom line is we don't have time, which again, yeah. you have... Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, sure. Because, yeah. Because Who's the important person in the room? You know, <laughs> Phil. You had a question. Yeah. Um, I guess on behalf of the audience, I want to thank you for a really brilliant thank presentation. Thank you. However, I have to challenge you. Um, you know, thank you for the remark you made that the only thing you can change is yourself. You are starting with a revolution in medicine. Uh huh. And revolutions go either from top down or bottom up, and I'm arguing you've got to do both. You have to work at the system level. You have to change 
medical yeah. profession, medical school mm -hmm. uh, agendas, the VA, uh, Kaiser, and I think I think you're making a mistake to settle for the lower level, uh, helping each doctor, okay. each anesthesiologist, you know, each nurse. That's fine, but I think you have to have part of your team yeah. has to work from top down. Yeah. Uh, the other last thing is um, a subtle point about patients. The worst thing that medical profession does is they transform people into patients. And once you do that, you have to work the doctor, everything you're doing is say, your work is to try to re recognize that there are people inside of that patient. Mm -hmm. So again, how do you change that? The simple thing is all patients should be, have to require their personal pajamas and have a picture of their family next yeah. to their bed. Mm -hmm. And so they remain people, yeah. not patients. Yeah, so, so Dr. Zimbardo was facing forward at the front row. I'm not sure if you heard that. His second comment he made was about the great danger of turning a human being into a patient and some of the things we can do to retain people's identity and humanity, like having your own pyjamas and your photograph and so on. And one of the insights I gained in my 50s is that wondering why I was so empathetic to patients is suddenly recognising that the archetypal model for hospital institutions is the English boarding school in all of its ghastliness. And in my, my formative careers were spent in a ghastly institution where you know, the matron was in charge, we had all these rules and regulations, you were stripped of identity, you slept in a shared dormitory, shared bathrooms, you had hideous food, etc., etc. The, the first point that Dr. Zimbardo made is that he said, you know, be careful, it would be a mistake only to try and change the system from the grassroots up, and you need to influence the leaders. Our strategy with that is on the film, some of those, that was the director of nursing of that hospital who began to speak in that film. So, so our strategy is not to try to persuade anyone to change, but where the ground is fertile and the leaders say, hey, this is really exciting, come and work with us, then we'll go in and come behind and support and encourage people who have influenced the leaders in the system who are going to create real change in their place and be a demonstration for others and to link them across the world. So we are not ignoring the leaders, but we're not going to try and persuade those who just don't get it because <laughs> it's a, a waste of energy. But the, as we travel around the world, we find places where the leaders are very keen to support this work, and those are the people we're going to support and help and link together. Very inspiring story, and, and part of the purpose of Hearts and Healthcare is just to gather those wonderful, inspiring stories and examples, and to bring that humanity and richness back into the culture of healthcare. So, thank you so much. I'm sorry for your recent loss, um, but it sounds like a wonderful death and a wonderful last few months of life um, that is so different 
from being a 93-year-old dying in an ICU, being treated to death. So that's, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. We're out of time. I want to thank you, Robin, for an inspiring and extraordinary lecture. Thank you.